So in this video, we're going to look at a fennel red broth test, and this is activity 5-3 in your lab book. We are going to start with day one, which is the setup of this experiment, and then we will conclude with day two, looking at the readout for this experiment. So what is the purpose of a fennel red broth test? Fennel red broth is also referred to as a PR broth. PR, again, is going to stand for fennel red. And the purpose of this test is to determine if bacteria can metabolize a specific carbohydrate. So the last unit we were looking at how do we isolate bacteria, how do we stain bacteria. Now we're starting to move into how do bacteria metabolize certain food sources, meaning what do they use to get energy. And so in our fennel red broth test, we're determining if bacteria can metabolize a specific carbohydrate. That carbohydrate, that could be any sugar. It could be glucose, it could be lactose, it could be maltose, sucrose, mannose, etc. The list could go on and on. In this test, we are testing one particular carbohydrate per tube. Now, in this experiment, we are doing this with four bacteria. We will be using Escherichia coli, which we will abbreviate EC. This is a gram-negative bacteria found in the intestines. We also have Enterobacter orogenes, which we are going to abbreviate EA. This is also found in the intestines. intestines. This is also a gram-negative bacteria. We have Alkaligenes faecalis. Faecalis, think feces. What, is, what do you think that tells you about where Alkaligenes faecalis is found? And the answer is it is also found in the intestines, right? Because feces comes from the intestines. So this is, again, another bacteria that's found in the intestines. It is also gram-negative. And then lastly, we have Proteus vulgaris, which we are going to abbreviate PV. Again, gram-negative bacteria found in the intestine. This is named after a sea god. It's a good swimmer. This bacteria is very modal because of the flagella that it possesses that allows it to move. So in this experiment, we have four different bacteria. They are all found in the intestines. And we are going to see for each of these four bacteria what sugars do they metabolize. And in this experiment, we will be testing two sugars. We are going to test the metabolism of glucose. Glucose is what we call a monosaccharide. It's one single sugar. And we will also be testing lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. It's two sugars linked together. It's a glucose plus a galactose linked together. That's gonna give us our disaccharide, which is lactose. So we wanna know of these four bacteria, which ones will metabolize glucose? Which ones will metabolize lactose? So this would normally in the lab be done in groups of four. And as a group of four, you would have four fennel red broth tubes. You would have four tubes that have a plastic cap. So they would have this plastic cap. And in that plastic cap tube, you would see this little glass tube inside of it that is what's referred to as a durum tube. A durum tube is there to determine if gas is produced. So you can tell which one is the tube with glucose, that's the glucose tube, because it has the durum tube in it. So the plastic cap, that tube is gonna have glucose. The metal cap tube would be the one that has lactose in it. It also doesn't have the durum tube. So that helps us to distinguish which is which. In case you were to make a mistake and accidentally switch your caps, you would still know what was in each tube because, again, the tube with the durum tube is going to be the tube that contains the sugar, glucose. The tube without the durum tube is your tube that has lactose. So as a group of four, you would have four organisms. You would have E. coli, Enterobacter orogenes, Alkaligenes faecalis, and Proteus vulgaris. And so to inoculate these, you would use a loop to inoculate these broths. Because again, a broth is going to be inoculated with a loop. So you would use your aseptic technique. Let's say I was in charge of E. coli. 
I would use aseptic technique to pick up E. coli from a slant, and then I would add it to my tube with glucose. I would reflame sterilize my loop, go back, pick up more E. coli, add it to the second tube that contains the lactose. And so each person would do their own organism. Again, one would do E. coli, one would do Enterobacter aerogenes, one would do Ocalogenes faecalis, and one person would do Proteus vulgaris. So each person would be responsible for making two tubes. And so now I have a video to show you the setup for the fennel red broth. So in this experiment, we are going to do a fennel red test. And the purpose of a fennel red test is to determine if bacteria can metabolize a specific sugar. So can they use a specific sugar as a food source? In our experiment, we will be testing glucose and lactose. Glucose is going to be a monosaccharide. It's one single sugar. Lactose is going to be a disaccharide. It's two sugars linked together. It's glucose plus galactose. And so we wanna see, do bacteria metabolize a particular carbohydrate? This could be done with any sugar. You could do this with sucrose, you could do this with maltose, you could use any sugar. But in this experiment, we will be doing this with glucose and lactose. So again, I'm gonna demonstrate how to inoculate just one tube. However, you'll have to realize that when we actually do this, we would have eight tubes for each organism, we would have one with a plastic cap, and there would be an identical tube with a metal cap, and one of the tubes is gonna have this little Durham tube. And the Durham tube is basically going to detect if gas is produced, because some bacteria, when they metabolize a specific sugar, they will produce gas as a byproduct. And so this would fill up with gas, if this was in the tube. And you would see the Durham tube rise up in the tube. So I'll show you this in our readout, but for now just realize that you would have one tube for each organism that has the Durham tube, and you would have another tube that does not have the Durham tube. Inoculating the tube with or without the Durham tube is the same idea. You just have to make sure with the Durham tube that when you inoculate it, that you don't bump the Durham tube and make it float in the tube. So let me show you how to inoculate this. So we're taking from a slant and we're inoculating into a broth. So to do this, we're gonna use our loop, right? Our loop is our utensil for inoculating a broth. So I'm gonna take my loop and I'm going to flame sterilize it. And I'm going to let it cool. I'm gonna work by my flame because my flame is my sterile area. And I'm going to let my loop cool by keeping it close to the flame. Again, that's my sterile field. So I'm now gonna take my tube that I need to pick up the bacteria, put the cap between my pinky and ring finger, flame it, go in, and pick up some bacteria. Flame it, cap, move it in my rack, and then I, I need to inoculate my broth. So I'm gonna flame it, and then I'm just gonna take my loop, and I'm just gonna kinda swirl it in the broth, hopefully you can see that, just kinda swirling it in the broth, just to get the bacteria off. I'm going to take my loop out, flame my cap, put the cap back on, and then I'm gonna flame from the base to the end of the loop, to re-sterilize my loop. Now notice that loop was in a broth before, and so you have to be careful when you flame sterilize after because you don't want that to splatter. And that's why I started with the base and worked towards the loop itself. And so now I've inoculated this broth. Again, for each organism, I would inoculate two. I would have one that has the plastic cap and one that has the metal cap because one of those contains glucose and one contains lactose. And so total, because there are four organisms, you would inoculate eight tubes. And then we would take these tubes, we would put them in a can, and we would put them in the incubator and allow them to grow for 48 hours.
and then read the results of the fennel red broth test. And so that's our fennel red broth. All right, so now we're gonna go into and talk about day two, which is going to be our readout day. And this would be done 48 hours after we inoculate our broth and put them in the incubator. So this would be done two days later. So before we can understand the readout of a fennel red broth test, we need to understand what is in the media. And so one of the things that you're gonna see is throughout the semester, when we look at these, what we call biochemical tests, what that means is in these tests, we have a substrate, meaning something we're testing if bacteria metabolized. We have an enzyme and we have a product and that product is going to give us some sort of readout. And so in order to understand these biochemical tests that have this substrate and product, we have to understand what's in the media. And so this is why in an earlier lab, we talked about types of media and what different ingredients are used for. And so now we're gonna start to break down in these biochemical tests, what is in the media? And then why is that ingredient present in the media? What is it there for? What purpose does it serve? So if we look in our lab book and we look at our recipe for our fennel red broth test, one of the things that you'll see on page 304 is the recipe for this broth. And the first ingredient listed is going to be referred to as pancreatic digest of casein. Now you might wonder, well, what the heck is pancreatic digest of casein? Well, casein is a milk protein, so it's a protein. If we were to give bacteria the intact protein, meaning if we gave them full casein with that's not broken down, that big bulky protein would not be able to get into the cell. And so the only way bacteria could use that protein is if they were to metabolize it. So in order to bypass that, what we do instead is we take casein and it gets mixed with these pancreatic extracts. Your pancreas is an organ that produces digestive enzymes. And so if we take pancreatic um, enzymes and we mix them with casein, those enzymes from the pancreas are gonna start to break down the casein into smaller pieces. And that pancreatic digest is then gonna be referred to as what we call peptones. Peptones are partially digested proteins. Basically, they're proteins that have been partially broken down so that they're small enough to get into the bacteria. And the reason we add this ingredient is that it's food for general growth. It's just there to support bacterial growth. So you'll often just see it written as food for general growth. We're not testing the metabolism of casein. In this case, we're just giving them amino acids because it has various you know, elements like carbon, nitrogen, other things that bacteria need to grow. And so by giving the bacteria this pancreatic digested casein, it's basically just food for general growth. And as a result, we would also call this complex or undefined media. Remember that undefined media has ingredients that can vary from batch to batch. Peptones are an ingredient that can vary from batch to batch. So when we look at our peptones, they'll be called a variety of different things. Pancreatic digest of casein, pancreatic digest of gelatin, etc. Similar idea. They're just partially digested proteins, peptones, which are there as food for general growth. So that's one ingredient in the media is gonna be our pancreatic digest of casein, our peptones. Next, we have our sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, NaCl, is there for salt balance. One of the things that you're gonna to start to learn about is that salt is important for bacterial cells because it affects the way that water moves either into or out of the cell. If there is not enough salt available in the media, what that does is that causes water to go into the bacteria, which is not good. If there is too much salt, it's gonna draw water out of the bacterial cell. So we need the appropriate balance of salt so that too much water doesn't go in 
and too much water doesn't go out. And so you'll learn more about salt balance later, but for now, just know that the reason we put sodium chloride in the media is that it's there for salt balance. It's basically to regulate which way water moves into or out of the cell. The next ingredient in the recipe is going to be the carbohydrate. And in our media, it's only gonna contain one specific sugar. We don't wanna mix a bunch of sugars together or we can't say which sugar the bacteria use as a food source. So each broth would contain only one specific sugar. In our experiment, the plastic cap, the one that had the Durham tube in it, is our tube that contains glucose. Again, glucose is our monosaccharide. The metal cap, the metal cap is going to be, it's going to contain lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. It's two sugars linked together. One of the things that we'll start to learn is that if bacteria are given the choice between using a monosaccharide like glucose or a disaccharide like lactose, preferentially monosaccharides would be used first, meaning that if bacteria were given the choice, glucose would be the preferred food source. If glucose is not available and lactose is, if bacteria contain enzymes to metabolize lactose, then they could metabolize lact lactose additionally. So in our test, the purpose of the carbohydrate, the reason we have a carbohydrate in the media, is that it's our substrate for metabolism of the carbohydrate. So again, it's what we are testing to see if bacteria can metabolize, meaning can they use that as a food source? We refer to that as the substrate. It's what goes in and we're seeing if bacteria have enzymes to break down that particular sugar. And so again, the substrate's gonna be different in the different tubes. In the one with the plastic cap, the substrate is gonna be glucose. In the one with the metal cap, the substrate is going to be the lactose. So our carbohydrate is in the media because it's our substrate for the metabolism of the carbohydrate. It's what we're actually testing in this experiment. Next, we have fennel red. Fennel red is an ingredient that we call a pH indicator. And what that means is that fennel red changes color depending on the pH of the solution. So that's why we call it a pH indicator. Now, in the case of fennel red, when it is yellow, yellow is going to be acidic. That is when the pH is less than seven. So when the pH starts to go down, the tube is gonna turn towards yellow. Reddish orange, so this is an uninoculated tube, meaning this is what the color of the tube would look like roughly when we begin. So a reddish orange color is going to be neutral meaning that it's approximately a pH of seven. And then magenta or pink, so this kind of pink color here, is going to be our alkaline condition, meaning that the pH is greater than seven. Now, in your lab book, it gives you cutoffs, like what pH has to be to be acidic. I'm not gonna make you memorize those numbers. What you do need to know, though, is that yellow, if you see the media turn yellow, that tells you that the pH is acidic. The pH is low. It's below seven, which is why it's yellow. If the tube is magenta or pink, it's going to be alkaline. The pH is gonna be greater than seven. Now, one of the things that I will also point out is one of the things you're gonna to start to learn is almost every pH indicator we use, whether it be fennel red or bromothane, thymol blue <clears throat> or uh, bromocresyl purple. Those are the three ones you're gonna see the most often. All three of those, yellow is acidic. So a good rule of thumb is yellow is acidic. There is one exception to that rule, and the one exception to that rule is going to be when we look at methyl red. Methyl red is going to be the opposite of phenyl red, meaning that in the case of methyl red, red or pink is going to be acidic. But as a general rule, everything else, 
yellow is acidic. So for phenyl red, yellow is acidic. Bromothymol blue, yellow is acidic. You're going to see that one when we get to our OF test. Bromocresyl purple, yellow is acidic. That's going to be for our decarboxylase test. So again, good rule of thumb, yellow is going to be acidic. So our tube, when we start, starts out reddish orange. It starts out at the neutral pH. That's why you see that referred to as the uninoculated control, meaning before any bacteria was introduced. And that uninoculated tube is going to start out at a neutral pH. And that makes sense because most bacteria prefer a neutral pH, meaning they're going to grow best at a neutral pH. So we want to start with the pH of the tube being neutral. And so these are the ingredients that are in the fennel red broth, and this is why we use each of these different ingredients. So let's talk about our readout. One of the things that you're going to notice is that I have posted on Canvas a biochemical identification sheet. Basically, it's a sheet that you will fill out for each of these biochemical tests, and it has a place for you to put the substrate, the enzyme, the products, the pH indicators, the reagents, what does a positive look like, what does a negative look like. That slide is at the end of this presentation, and what we will do is in our Zoom meeting, I will go over and we will fill out the one for fennel red together so that you learn how to fill those in and how to study for these biochemical tests. Because the way you study for these tests is going to be different than the, the way that you study for the staining, um, the staining experiments. These you want to understand substrate, enzyme, products, what color is positive, what color is negative, and why. So in our test, in our fennel red broth test, our substrate is our carbohydrate. That carbohydrate in the plastic cap tube is going to be glucose. In the metal cap tube, that carbohydrate is going to be lactose. So that's my substrate. It's one of those two carbohydrates. Now, one of the things I wanna point out too is your book uses in this activity the term fermentation. And when they say fermentation, they're simply talking about the metabolism of the sugar. You have to be careful because in a strict sense, fermentation is often referred to or used when you're talking about an anaerobic process, meaning that it happens in the absence of oxygen. That's what you're gonna see when we do our OF test. In our OF test, the fermentation is specifically looking at the anaerobic condition. In our fennel red broth, though, that's in a liquid. There's no way that we're sealing out oxygen, so it's not actually an anaerobic process. And so that's why in the earlier slides, I was careful to refer to it as the metabolism of a specific carbohydrate, just so that you wouldn't get confused with the idea of fermentation. because Again, your lab book uses fermentation kind of broadly when it's talking about metabolism. And it, in this sense, it's not talking about simply an anaerobic process. So that's why in this activity, I didn't say fermentation. I specifically said metabolism of carbohydrate just to be a little more specific. So substrate is going to be our carbohydrate, our enzyme. We're not testing one particular enzyme in this case. In some of these experiments, we will be testing a particular enzyme, meaning in the indole production test, for example, you're gonna see that we're testing for if bacteria have an enzyme called tryptophanase. ACE tells you enzyme. So in some experiments, we're testing for one particular enzyme. In this experiment, we're not. There are a variety of enzymes that will assist in this process. So what we write under enzymes is we are going to write various endoenzymes. Now what is an endoenzyme? An endoenzyme is an enzyme that stays within the bacterial cell. 
One of the things that you're gonna see is bacteria will produce endoenzymes, meaning they stay within the bacteria. And in other cases, bacteria will produce what are called exoenzymes, exo, think exit. Those are enzymes that are produced in the bacteria and then the bacteria is gonna secrete those enzymes out. They're gonna release the enzyme from the cell. They're gonna break down the substrate outside and then transfer in the smaller pieces. But in this case, these are endoenzymes. These are enzymes that are within the cell. So we are going to test for if bacteria have these enzymes to break down these carbohydrates within the bacterial cell. And the products of this test would be acids. So it's gonna be a variety of different acids. Pyruvic acid, could be lactic acid. Any number of acids could be produced. In some cases, it could be alcohol. So if the organism does alcoholic fermentation, for example. And then lastly, plus or minus gases. Meaning that some bacteria, when they metabolize sugar, they will produce carbon dioxide gas and other bacteria do not. It has to do with the type of fermentation that they do. So that's your substrate, your enzyme, and your product. So now, now that we know our substrate and our enzyme and our product, now we can start to interpret what the different colors tell us. So the first thing we look for when we're doing this test is we're looking for turbidity. Turbidity is referring to, is the broth cloudy? If the broth is cloudy, if you can see like little particulates in the broth, that is referred to as turbidity. And what that tells us is that the bacteria grew. So in order for us to make any conclusions about our test, we first need to look for turbidity we need to make sure that the bacteria grew. So when we get these tubes out of the incubator, we would vortex and see, do we see turbidity? Do we see you know, particulates in the broth, which tells us that the bacteria grew? So that's the first thing we're looking for. We're looking for turbidity, which tells us growth. Now, if we see yellow, a yellow broth that has turbidity, Remember, what is the pH like for a yellow tube? And the answer is a yellow tube tells us that it is acidic. So it would be an acidic tube, that would be the pH, and we would record that result as A for acidic, slash G, which refers to gas, so this would be a tube that is yellow with gas, or A minus, meaning it's acidic, but no gas. So if we see the pH is acidic, is that a positive or a negative for carbohydrate metabolism? Notice that is your positive because if we look at our reaction, right, our carbohydrate would produce acids. So if the pH turns yellow, that tells us that the bacteria were able to metabolize that carbohydrate and they were able to produce those acids, which lowered the pH and caused the phenyl red to turn yellow. So that is a positive in our test. That means that bacteria have these enzymes that allow them to do this process. So that's positive for the metabolism of sugar. Now that could be with or without gas. Either way, it doesn't matter if it's yellow, that's considered positive for metabolism of that carbohydrate. Now, if we see reddish pink and turbidity. Turbidity means that it grew, right? So it means that it grew. But if it's reddish pink, that tells us that the pH is alkaline. So when we record this result, we can't use A because we already use A for acidic. When we record this result, we use the letter K. So K is for alkaline. So if the tube is alkaline, is that positive or negative for the metabolism of sugar? And the answer is it's negative for the metabolism of sugar.
it's negative for metabolism of sugar because if the sugar was metabolized, it would produce acids. Acids would lower the pH. But notice in this tube, the pH went up. The pH is alkaline. So that tells us that the bacteria did not use sugar as a food source. So thinking back to what else is in the fennel red broth media, if they didn't use the sugar, what did the bacteria use as a food source? And the answer is they used peptones as a food source. They used the proteins as a food source. And when bacteria use proteins as a food source, they are going to produce alkaline products. They're gonna produce things like ammonia, which is gonna raise the pH. So when peptones are used as a food source, the pH is going to go up. And when the pH goes up, that tells us that it's negative for the metabolism of the sugar. The sugar was not used as a food source. So instead, bacteria had to use the other food source, which in this case would have been the peptones. So that's a negative for that test. The last result that you could get is that you get no growth, meaning there's no turbidity in the tube. Now, if there's no turbidity and there's no growth, can we make a conclusion about whether or not bacteria can metabolize the sugar? And the answer is no. We can't make a conclusion if we don't see any turbidity. So we would say our interpretation of this would be that there's no result and that the result is inconclusive. We cannot say whether or not bacteria can metabolize that sugar or not because we don't have growth. And in this test, because it's an undefined media, because there are multiple food sources, bacteria should have been able to use something to grow. And so if they didn't use something to grow, right, it could mean that maybe there was a problem with your inoculation. Maybe your loop was too hot when you went to pick up bacteria and you killed all the bacteria that you were trying to transfer. And that's why nothing grew. We can't say if that bacteria can metabolize the sugar if it doesn't grow. So if we see no turbidity, our conclusion would be that it's inconclusive, meaning we cannot say if bacteria can or cannot metabolize that sugar because without growth, we can't make that conclusion. So that's gonna generally be the case for most of our complex or undefined media, meaning that if we have multiple food sources in there, bacteria should use something to grow. And if they don't, generally, that's gonna be referred to as inconclusive. We can't say whether or not bacteria can use that carbohydrate because we didn't detect any growth in the first place. So now we need to talk, uh, talk about why must the readout be done between 24 and 48 hours after inoculation? So we have to look at our tubes or at least put our tubes in the refrigerator after 48 hours. We can't let them grow longer than 48 hours or we're not going to get the right result. So let's talk about why that is. So when we start out at time zero, right, our pH is going to be orange, reddish orange. It's a neutral pH. That's going to be where we start. Now, let's say that our bacteria does, in fact, metabolize the carbohydrate. So at 24 hours, bacteria are going to start to metabolize the carbohydrate. The pH is going to go down because we're producing acidic products. This continues at 48 hours, right, because, again, as we're metabolizing that carbohydrate, we are the bacteria are producing more acidic products and the pH is gonna drop. So within that zero to 48 hour time window, bacteria are metabolizing the sugar first. If they can use sugar, they will metabolize the sugar first <clears throat> and that will then lower the pH. So the pH will decrease. Now, at some point, right, as bacteria keep using the sugar, once the sugar runs out, then there's no more sugar in the media 
And so you have to think to yourself, well, if the sugar runs out, what can bacteria use as a food source next? And the answer is, is when there's no more sugar, bacteria are then going to metabolize the proteins. Remember what happens to the pH as bacteria metabolize the peptones or the proteins. And so after the sugar runs out, bacteria start to metabolize the proteins and produce alkaline products, and the pH turns back towards orange or pink, depending on how far it is. So at 72 hours, you might start to see the pH go back up, right? Maybe it's getting closer to pH 6 now. As we get to 96, it's now maybe above a pH of 7, meaning that if we were to do this experiment, right, and we did not look at those results until 96 hours, right, if we waited until 96 hours before we looked at the tube, if we pulled it out and looked at it here, the tube is going to be either orange or pink, depending on the cutoff. And if it's orange or pink, our interpretation at that point would be that bacteria did not metabolize the sugar. But the problem is it's not necessarily that bacteria don't metabolize the sugar. They may have metabolized the sugar initially. However, once the sugar ran out, they had no choice but to metabolize the proteins, which then raised the pH back up, which is why it's not yellow. And so you would get what we call a false negative. You would record it. If you were looking at your tube at 96 hours, you would record that as a negative because it's not yellow, but that's not the right result. That's simply because you didn't read out your tube in the appropriate time frame. You must look at your results within 28 to 48 hours after inoculation. And so this is just showing you what that would look like. So the pH would go down, and then as the sugar ran out and bacteria started to metabolize the peptones, the pH would go back up. So we need to basically do our readout in this window to have an accurate result. Because if we miss that window and we go back after 48 hours, if we let those tubes go longer, the pH is going to do what we call a reversion. It's going to revert back towards the neutral pH again. And that's simply because there's no more sugar. So it's extremely important in this test to do your readout between 24 and 48 hours. You don't want to wait past 48 hours or you're going to get the wrong result because of that pH reversion. So now let's look at the result of the fennel red broth test. All right, so let's look at our results. So these are the results for the four organisms. And so what you're looking at is the plastic cap tube. Again, is the one that has glucose and it has a durum tube. Now, these are a little bit tricky because they are in a rack, so you can see the rack in here but you can still see what the results are, so I'll explain this. So the plastic cap is the one that contains the sugar glucose. Again, that's our monosaccharide. Our metal cap is going to contain the sugar lactose. Lactose is our disaccharide. So one organism, or actually you'll see that it's actually two organisms that have the same result. Notice that this first tube is yellow, the turbidity you can actually see down here, it's actually settled in this tube, which is why if you were doing this in the lab, we would have you vortex the tube so that you could see that turbidity better. But you can in fact see, you can see this cloudiness kind of at the bottom. That's that turbidity, that's the growth. So in this glucose tube, it's yellow. What does the yellow tell you about the pH. Is the pH acidic or alkaline? The answer is that if it's yellow, it's acidic. And you can see this little air bubble here. This air bubble in the Durham tube, that's the gas. So you can see it here. This one has it. You can see it here. This one has it. This would be acidic with gas. 
So this result is Enterobacter orogenes, that's our EA, and we would record this as positive for metabolism of glucose, right? That means that bacteria were able to metabolize the glucose. The, the result would be acidic slash gas, right? It's acidic, it produces acidic products, and it produces gas. This tube with the metal cap doesn't have a Durham tube, so we can't record gas or not. All we can simply say is that that tube is acidic, which means that Enterobacter orogenes was able to metabolize both glucose and lactose. It was able to utilize both sugars. So it could utilize both. Now notice for the next organism, the next set of tubes, we have exactly the same result. That is for E. coli. And E. coli, again, is going to metabolize both sugars. It can metabolize glucose and it can metabolize lactose. And so in the lactose tube, it's just acidic, so we would record that as a positive. In the tube with the glucose, it's acidic plus gas. That would still be a positive. So E. coli can metabolize both sugars. Now look at the next pair of tubes. The next pair of tubes are both pink. They both have turbidity, right? So they do have growth, but they are pink. What is the pH like in a tube that is pink? And the answer is that that is alkaline. If it is alkaline, that is a negative. So both of these tubes are alkaline. They did not metabolize the sugar, but instead they metabolized the peptones. So that's the case for the alkaligenes faecalis we would refer to alkaligenes faecalis as being non-saccharolytic. Non-saccharolytic means that they don't use sugars. A saccharide is referring to sugar. So non-saccharolytic means that alkaligenes faecalis does not use sugar. It uses the peptones. Now, why would an organism do this? Well, you have to remember that all four organisms are found in the intestines. They are all gut microbes. So you have to imagine that if all the different bacteria that are in your gut utilize exactly the same food sources, they're going to be competing for a common resource and that's gonna drive certain species to extinction. And so what happens is, is that Alkaligenes faecalis evolved alongside E. coli, for example, in the intestine. And so Alkaligenes faecalis evolved to be non-saccharolytic. It's like it's saying, E. coli, you can use the sugar, I'll use the peptones, that'll be my food source. And so they're doing something called resource partitioning. E. coli is using one set of food sources, Alkaligenes faecalis is using something different. And so they evolved alongside one another in the gut and they just utilize different food sources. And so Alkaligenes faecalis will utilize the peptones, uh, e. coli, for example, will utilize sugars preferentially. And so they use different food sources. Alkaligenes faecalis does not use glucose. It does not use lactose. The last result, we have the tube with glucose. It's yellow, turbidity with gas. So we would record that as AG, acidic with gas. And the lactose tube is pink. So we would record that as K. So what this tells us is that this tube that is yellow with gas, so acidic with gas, that's positive. This tube is alkaline, which is gonna be our negative. This is the case for Proteus vulgaris, PV. Proteus vulgaris can metabolize the glucose. It has the enzymes to break down glucose, but it does not produce enzymes to metabolize lactose. It does not use that disaccharide. So this would be an example of a bacteria that uses one, but not the other. EA and EC, so Enterobacter orogenes and E. coli, can utilize both. Not all bacteria do that. 
Proteus can utilize glucose, but not lactose. Alkaligenes faecalis doesn't use either. It doesn't use sugars at all. It's non-sacrolytic. And so these would be the results and the readout for your fennel red broth test. And so when you're studying these tubes, you don't have to memorize that if you saw pink, pink, that that is alkaligenes faecalis. And you don't have to memorize that yellow pink was the result for Proteus vulgaris. That's not the point of this. The point is, if we were to show you a picture of these tubes, if I were to show you a picture, a pair of tubes like this, and you saw this result, you should be able to tell me what it means. So again, if you see pink, pink, you should say, well, those are negative for metabolism of the carbohydrate. They did not utilize the carbohydrate. That tube is alkaline, which tells us that bacteria utilize the peptones. So that's how you wanna study for these biochemical tests. You wanna not necessarily memorize the results, which bacteria gave which result, but you should understand the readout. What do the different colors tell you? Does that tell you something about whether the test is positive or whether the test is negative? That's how you're gonna study for these biochemical tests. So let me show you an example of the way that we're going to study for these, uh, these biochemical tests. So posted on Canvas are these biochemical identification sheets. They say biochemical identification summaries. And so you'll see a page, a PDF, and on each page there are two of these little diagrams. And so what you'll do is you'll write the name of the test. So in this case, our name of our test would be a fennel red broth test. You would write the name of the media. You would indicate what is the substrate in this test, what is the enzyme in this test, and then what are the products in this test. You would record what does a positive look like in a fennel red broth test. What does a negative look like in a fennel red broth test? You will record if there is a reagent. Typically speaking, a reagent is something you're gonna add at the end of a test to determine if some product is present. In this case, there is no reagent, but instead we have a pH indicator, and our pH indicator is our fennel red. And then this would be where you would put some additional notes. So in our Zoom, I will go over an example of how to fill this in for your fennel red broth test. Because for the rest of these biochemical tests, so you'll need another one when we do our OF test, we're gonna have another one for indole, there's gonna be another one for methyl red, there's gonna be a lot more of these starting to come up. And so you wanna start getting in the habit of how to study for these particular tests and the best way to study for this is to do these biochemical identification sheets. My recommendation is when you come to Zoom, when we go over this on Zoom, it's helpful if you have different color pens. And the reason for that is when you write these in different color pens, like I write the substrate in one color and I write the enzyme in another color and I write the product in another color. And so let's say I wrote this in pink for the substrate, the enzyme is in green, and the product is in blue. Why that helps is because if you're looking at a page, let's say you did this in pencil, and the whole page is in pencil, it's a lot harder to recall what's written on the paper when you have a bunch of things that all look the same. For me, if they're color-coded, I'm in an exam and I can literally picture what it looks like on the page. I'm like that, I could see that, it's in green pen. What did the green pen say? And I could visualize and I know in my head, my enzymes were always in the green pen. So I need to think about what was written in green pen? What did it say on that biochemical sheet? So again, my recommendation for these and to have them available to you when we go over this on Zoom would be to have different color pens or markers or whatever else you wanna use. But I do find that if you color code this, 
it makes it a lot easier when you're studying. So that would be my recommendation to you is color code this. So if you have those different color pens available, have those ready when we go over this on Zoom so that you can fill one of these in with me while you're doing this test. And so this is the end of the fennel red broth test.